Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my presentation is the Phoenix Goat Project Feasibility Study on track for the second half of 2020. Uh, we do have some forward-looking statements, so I draw your attention to the cautionary notes uh, presented on this page. Uh, first of all, a little bit about the uh, COVID-19. Uh, obviously, we have taken precautionary measures, uh, effective March uh, the 12th, uh, both at the corporate office and at site. I'm happy to report that uh, both at the head office and uh, within Red Lake, uh, the community where the uh, project is situated, there have been no cases, no presumptive cases of COVID-19. And uh, we remain on track for delivery of our feasibility study in the second half of 2020. Uh, we recently completed a private placement financing and uh, the company currently has a very strong treasury of approximately $17 million Canadian cash in the bank. And we're fully funded well past the delivery of our feasibility study in the second half of uh, this year. A little bit about the share capital structure and the, uh, the treasury. Uh, as we said, approximately 17 million Canadian cash in the bank, effective April the 1st, 2020. Uh, we do have a long-term loan facility, uh, which is now a short-term liability as it matures December 31st of 2020. Uh, as part of our project financing towards the fourth quarter of this year, uh, to bring the Phoenix Go project into commercial production. Uh, we do believe there will be a debt component of that project financing, and it's our intention at that point in time to restructure uh, the uh, Sprott Lending uh, long-term debt, which is due. If it goes to full maturity at the end of the year, uh, including the 5% payment in kind interest rate associated with that loan facility, uh, total outstanding would be 14.7 million Canadian dollars. We have uh, 96 million shares issued uh, and outstanding on a fully diluted basis, uh, about 103 million. The options and warrants are not currently in the money. They have a weighted average price around $1.34 Canadian. The current market cap of the company would be about 64 million based on a share price of 67 cents. We're covered by seven analysts with a target price ranging from $1.45 to $3.25 after the project financing. And as you can see, we have a very strong institutional uh, shareholder base. Uh, many of those institutions would have uh, supported myself when I was at Kirkland Lake, uh, where they saw a 550% increase in the share appreciation during my tenure there. And they remain firmly committed shareholders of, of Rubicon. I'd also like to draw your attention that over the last three years, I've put $750,000 of my own money into the company at a weighted average price of $1.32 Canadian. Last year, uh, we put out a, a preliminary economic assessment. Uh, we used a long-term gold price of $13.25 US and at a 0.75 exchange rate to the Canadian dollar that gave us 1762 Canadian dollars an ounce. The high level economics of the project were uh, an after tax 40% uh, IRR, an NPV of 135 million using a 5% discount factor, and uh, approximately 192 million Canadian dollars of free cash flow over an approximate 6.2 years uh, of initial mine life. On the right-hand side of that slide, we also uh, break out the capital requirements uh, for the funding of the project. There's approximately 43 million required in underground development and infrastructure. And I'll show you on a future slide that the bulk of that is uh, capital development uh, from within the mine. We have to purchase an equipment fleet, which we're currently showing at 16.9 million. Uh, there is the possibility that we would look at a four or five year capital lease and therefore spread those payments out over that period of time. And then on surface, we want to put in a surface primary crusher uh, next to the head frame. Uh, we'd like to raise the tailings dam by uh, at least two meters uh, and also install an ammonia reactor into our wastewater treatment facility. And that makes up the bulk of 22.8 million Canadian dollars that we're showing there. 
An 18% contingency brings us out to a total initial capital of 101 million Canadian. And then the PEA is showing that there's a 20 month ramp up period from when we greenlight the project to commercial production, which requires 45.7 million Canadian dollars in working capital. Now the good news is, is that from month 12 through to month 20, uh, we basically see a production of 44 and a half thousand ounces of gold which gives us about 75 million Canadian dollars in revenue from gold sales. And that's at a 1762 Canadian dollar gold price. Obviously that number would be significantly higher if we were looking at gold prices around today's spot price, which is 22 to 2300 Canadian dollars an ounce. So all in all that gives us positive cash flow from operations of 29 million Canadian. If we deduct that from the 101 million, we see net pre-commercial production capital of about 72 million. And then when we look at our inventory adjustments, we come out with a number of about 81 million Canadian. If we then add in the sprot lending facility as part of the debt that needs to be refinanced and add in another 15 million, you can see the project funding requirements are gonna be somewhere between 90 and 100 million Canadian dollars. Those funding requirements, however, will drop should we be in the fortunate position to see spot gold prices as we bring the Phoenix project into production. If we then look at the sensitivity table, and there you can see the base case. If we look at today's spot prices of well in excess of 1600 US dollars an ounce and a 0 0.71 exchange rate from the Canadian dollar to US dollar, we see an IRR after tax of 81%. A 319 million uh, NPV on the project, a 5% discount factor, and over 400 million Canadian dollars in free cash flow. And I'm sure you would agree with me, uh, very, very strong economics uh, that uh, obviously we would greenlight this project on if we were to see those type of numbers uh, coming out within our feasibility study. To look a little bit to the uh, risk mitigation, what's the downside uh, for, uh, for Rubicon? Well, if you believe that the NPV of the project is a conservative 135 million, we also have 28,000 hectares of land in Red Lake. Uh, during a strategic review process before I joined the company three years ago, uh, there was a process being ran which included the sale of the company. The work that's made purely for the regional land package alone of 20 and 25 million Canadian dollars. And that was in a distressed situation. So we believe today the land is easily worth between 30 to 50 million Canadian dollars, particularly considering that it's contiguous and butts up against uh, evolutions, uh, 31,000 hectares of land in Red Lake. With $17 million in the bank and $690 million in tax loss pools, which can be used for both the Phoenix project and the portion which can be used away from Phoenix to look at M&A, we believe the financial assets of the company are easily worth 20 million Canadian dollars. If we were to add all of that up, we would have 185 million, deduct off the 15 million for spot lending, and it brings you out even in a downside scenario of about 170 million Canadian dollar valuation against the current market cap of 64 million Canadian dollars. So we think even in a downside scenario, there's significant upside uh, for, uh, from these valuations for Rubicon, uh, both current and future shareholders of the company. Now, for those of you that have followed Rubicon in the past, uh, between 2009 and 2016, there was essentially $700 million of sunk cost into this project. So today we have a, a mill which is built and designed and constructed for 1,800 metric tons per day, although currently it's only permitted for 1,250 metric tons per day on average. We did put 40,000 tons of material through the mill two years ago in a bulk uh, test trial mining program and saw 95% metallurgical recoveries and a 14% positive gold reconciliation compared to what the then 43101 resource uh, predicted. Uh, so you can also see we have a 720 meter deep uh, shaft there on the left-hand side in the foreground. 
There's a fully permitted tailings facility, a 200-man camp. There's also a 44 kVA electrical line uh, right into the mine site. We have access to fresh water. And of course, we're some 12 kilometers outside the community of Barmertown, uh, Red Lake. And there you can see the effective June of 2019, we had $690 million of tax pools, of which approximately half are ring fenced through the Phoenix Go project, with the remaining half uh, able to be deployed by the company in future uh, M&A activity. Uh, which we will look at as the uh, the company uh, evolves with its business plans. Uh, here on slide nine, you can see the production profile that came out of the PEA. On the left hand slide of the uh, side of the, uh, the bar chart, you can see the 44 and a half thousand ounces of pre-commercial production um, uh, being produced, uh, and then you can see uh, the solid bars would be the commercial production. Uh, we're see, seeing a C1 cash cost of 624 US dollars an ounce, all in sustaining costs of 882. If we were to add in the corporate overhead and the pre commercial production capital plus the royalties, we'd be looking at uh, all in cost, uh, everything thrown in, including the kitchen sink, of just under 1100 uh, US dollars an ounce. And there you can also see the production profile of a approximately 80,000 ounces of annual production over about a 6.5 year entire mine life. Slide 10, um, everything you see in magenta on this slide is uh, currently a sunk uh, cost uh, from Rubicon 1.0, uh, as well as having a full uh, shaft with uh, production hoisting facilities, 10 ton skips that sit over the cage. We also have 14,000 uh, meters of development uh, within the mine. Uh, the blue you're looking at, the cyan, is the pre-commercial production development, approximately 6,000 meters. And at $6,000 per meter, that would be 36 million Canadian dollars, which is part of the 43 that we showed earlier on the, uh, the upfront capital. And we're also showing development uh, rates of 14.7 meters per day uh, over a 24 hour period. Those rates are conservative. And if we were able to improve those rates, let's say to 20 meters a day, then obviously we could shorten the timelines to commercial production below the 20 months that we're currently showing in the PEA. And we'd expect to show something uh, sooner to commercial production within the feasibility study. We're also showing on a cost per meter, uh, development headings ranging between five and a half and six and a half thousand dollars a meter. Those are high compared to our peer groups and other uh, exploration groups that are looking to bring projects into commercial production. Those rates are actually contractor rates. And of course, there is an ability that if it was owner operator crews, we might therefore be able to see a 10 to 15% potential reduction in that cost per meter. And again, I think this is an opportunity that we'll be exploring within our feasibility study. Now within the PEA, uh, we also get the ability to include an inferred resource. And you'll see there, that the green area, which is the sustaining capital, goes all the way to 1,400 meters below surface. Now, because we're looking at a feasibility study, we only get the ability to include measured and indicated resource. And that essentially means that um, the ramp will no longer be going to 1,400 level, but instead within the feasibility will only approach 1,100 meters uh, below surface. So that means uh, comparing apples with apples, we should see about 300 vertical meters being taken out of the of, uh, development coming out of the feasibility study when compared to the PEA, which should save us somewhere in the range of 30 to $50 million of sustaining uh, capital. If we then look at the resource profile uh, and the progress that we've achieved over the last uh, three years, you can see we now have 811,000 ounces of measured and indicated. Importantly, in the measured category, the drill density is on an eight meter drill density. And in the indicated category, we're looking at 18 meters 
so the weighted average drill density of MNI is now on a 15 meter drill density, which is fairly tight. Subsequently, if we're able to put mining shapes, uh, slope shapes into the resource model, I'm confident that uh, any mine plan that we would put out, we would be able to deliver on that based on the tight drill density that we have. I'll also uh, draw your attention there to the ounces per vertical meter. Mineralization starts about 100 meters below surface and the MNI currently goes down to around 900 meters below surface, meaning that the ounces per vertical meter is slightly north of 1,000 ounces, which is a, a key threshold that uh, you know, most uh, projects look for. Slide 12, here you can see the measured category in red, the indicated in green, and as I said, it goes down almost uh, 900 meters below surface. Now we're targeting the area that's in the rectangle, which is approximately 190,000 ounces of inferred material. We've been infill drilling there since uh, October of last year. And we believe that if we can supply our consultant with the assays from that drilling um, before May of this year, then there's a possibility that we could include those uh, further measured and indicated ounces in the uh, life of mine plan within the feasibility study, which will be delivered in the second half of this year. When we did the PEA last year, we found a 70% conversion of MI over into the mineable resource. So if we assumed we found an additional 100,000 ounces of inferred material moving up into MI, giving us 911,000 ounces of MI by the time we complete the feasibility study, that would convert over to about 600 to 650,000 ounces of reserves and at 80,000 ounces of annual production, you could see how that would give us a seven to eight year mine life, which is gonna be 12 to 18 months better than what we saw within the feasibility study. And of course, as we said earlier, the sustaining capital only goes to 1,100 meters below surface and not 13 or 1,400 meters below surface. So a little bit on the schedule. The feasibility study started late last year and uh, has progressed well. We're on track to see the final report delivered to the company in September of this year, where we hope to shortly release uh, to the markets. Now, we've also began work on some of our close proximity targets, which uh, I'd like to share with you now. Um, so if we look, first of all, look at the properties uh, within uh, Red Lake, we've drawn a 10 kilometer uh, radius out from the Phoenix uh, Gold Project. You'll see how it encapsulates the current uh, Red Lake and Campbell Mines and Koshner that uh, Evolution uh, recently inherited uh, from, uh, from Newmont. But I'll also draw your attention to our vast regional land package. And if we took uh, the East Bay, uh, uh, claims as an example, uh, which Rubicon 100% owns. You can see next door, uh, Evolution has a compliant resource on the gas zone, 360,000 ounces at eight grams, with mineralization relatively close to surface. Rubicon 1.0 drilled on the East Bay side of the, the, the property boundary at depth, found the same mineralogy, the same lithology as what uh, was at the gas zone and found mineralization. And we believe that that's an extension of the gas zone through the imaginary proper property boundary to depth onto Rubicon's East Bay property. And there are many other opportunities like that that we would like to explore and follow up on as we move the company forward over the course of the next uh, three to five years. Now looking in section, uh, here you can see uh, the shaft, which is the vertical red line on this slide. And there to the left, uh, McFinley. Now, McFinley is a former producing mine that was briefly in production in the early 2000s. Today, it has a non-compliant resource of 66,000 ounces at 6.8 grams per ton in the ground. And over the course of the last uh, several months, we've been underground in the upper levels, taking chips and muck samples. We have access to historical core, and it's our intention to move in a diamond drill shortly and drill uh, some uh, of the areas out so that before the end of this year, we can actually produce a 43-101 compliant resource on the McFinley deposit 
in and around the time that we will be delivering a compliant um, a feasibility study on the Phoenix deposit here. And the plan of action is to show the market that we have significant incremental or organic growth opportunities all within several kilometers of the Phoenix shaft and the mill uh, on surface. Then uh, on this slide, uh, looking to the right, we have the Penn, Car and Island zone. These blocks we're looking at here are one kilometer blocks. So you can see the Penn zone from the 244 exploration drift, the four or 500 meter deep hole there would get us out to the Penn. Six, seven hundred meters gets us to the car zone. And it's our intention uh, over the course of the next several quarters to put a diamond drill on the 244 exploration drift and drill the pen zone from underground, which is the first time in the project's history that that has been done. You can see on this slide, however, that from surface, both the pen, car, and island zone have been drilled. And you can see that some of the exploration uh, mineralization results are quite significant. And again, here in early 2021, we'd like to be in a position where we can publish a compliant 43101, uh, let's say on the Penn zone, to show the market that we have significant organic growth opportunities. So key takeaways to summarize, obviously we have a very robust PEA, 40% uh, after tax IRR using uh, 1325 US dollar gold. When we put in the spot prices, the numbers are significantly higher. Uh, we have vast tax pools uh, at the end of the six and a half years of mine life showing in the PEA, there's still 521 million Canadian dollars in unused tax pools, which can be used not just at Phoenix, but for M&A activity. We've grown the resource over the last three years by over 500%. And we strongly believe that as the deposit is open across strike and at depth, we could continue to grow the resource. And of course, strategically with 28,000 hectares of land in the prestigious gold mining camp of Red Lake, uh, we believe the land package really needs to be explored and is extremely uh, strategic and undervalued. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you.